Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. I'm Rose Skeeters, host of From Borderline to Beautiful, a show about hope and recovery for BPD. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had a great week. This episode is dedicated to all of my current clients. Keep working hard and moving forward. Don't give up. Maintain self-discipline to the mission. All right, today I am going to address three topics that all tie into each other. Unconditional love, arguing in a relationship, and the power of choice. Let's start with talking about unconditional love. I have addressed this in previous episodes because I believe that not being loved unconditionally in early childhood or not having perceived what we received from our early childhood caregivers as unconditional love prevents us from loving others unconditionally and from experiencing unconditional love from a partner as a good thing. Usually, when we haven't been loved unconditionally and we get unconditional love, it's kind of weird and pretty uncomfortable. Oftentimes, I ask clients what kind of love they received from their early childhood caregivers, and 99.9% of the time they say conditional love. Even those people who choose to protect their caregivers or defend them Describe conditional love when they're talking about what kind of love they experienced as a kid. So they assume that the love that they experienced is actually unconditional, and that's fair because that's all they know and that's all that they have experienced. When we grow up seeing that love comes with strings attached, then we assume that this is true for our adult relationships and for the relationships we have with our friends, family, and children. What do I mean by love coming with strings attached? As a child growing up in a household with dysfunctional parents or parents who did not learn from their caregivers how to regulate their emotions, this could mean so many things. Ever made a mistake as a young child? Maybe you were pouring yourself a glass of milk, right? And it spilled accidentally. Maybe your father was in a bad mood and beat you for spilling the milk. Maybe he was particularly intense that day, so he chose to give you the silent treatment for a few days after. As icing on the cake, right? He took his love away from you for spilling milk, for making a mistake. He expected perfection. That is conditional love. Conditional love is when your mother expects you to date or marry a certain kind of person and doesn't approve of the individual you chose. So she openly mocks him or her or gives them the cold shoulder at a family gathering. Conditional love is when your brother calls you every time he is down on his luck and needs some cash to get by. Conditional love is when your mother is nice and attentive to you to get you to watch your younger brothers and sisters so she can go get high or go out on a date. Conditional love is when your father treats you like you are your mother because he's still angry at her for her choices and for the dissolution of his own relationship. Conditional love is when your parents need you to parent them and you miss out on your childhood. Conditional love happens whenever the person you are in relationship with takes their love away from you, disconnects with you, kind of goes away and leaves the space emotionally because you have done something that doesn't meet their oftentimes way too high expectations. So I want you to take a minute right now and come up with your own example of how the love you experienced as a child was conditional and also how you show conditional love to those you are in relationship with. Be honest. There's no way that we can love unconditionally if we have no idea what that feels like. We need to learn. Remember that there's pain in truth, though this is the stuff of growth. Now that we have revisited the concepts of conditional and unconditional love, we can talk about arguing in a relationship. 
oftentimes even as folks work on not being tyrannical in a relationship. And when the intense anger and rage subsides because of doing that time out work that I said in previous episodes, there's still some work to be done around avoiding unnecessary conflict in a relationship. Remember that quote from the beginning, that was a proverb. Arguing just to argue is something that many individuals with borderline personality disorder, even those of us who say we are conflict avoidant, do in relationships. It is important to remember that as you work on unconditional love, you also work on being a good partner and on not arguing for the sake of being right. This week, I heard from several individuals who wanted to know how to get their friend, family member, or partner to listen to them. One person even told me that they raised their hand when in conversation with their partner to indicate that they have something important to say in an argument. The thing about getting other people to hear us is that we usually want them not only to hear us, but to agree with us because we need to be right. Does this sound like you? Does it drive you nuts when you are right and someone else is trying to convince you that you aren't? Do you get into a disagreement and then find yourself Googling and sending proof of you being right to the person you're arguing with? Okay, so clearly it takes two people to engage in an argument. So if you and your partner are listening to this together, awesome. To the partners out there, this is just good relationship advice. When you argue with your partner to be right, you stop focusing on the relationship you are in and you start focusing on yourself and being right. One of the quickest paths to taking your love away from someone is arguing to prove your point and just to be right. The next time you get into a disagreement with your partner, don't try to be heard to prove that you are right at the expense of your relationship. Focus on your partner instead. Do they need to be right because they are feeling insecure? Are they actually right from their perspective? Can you agree to just disagree? Do you have to send them all those search engine lists to prove your point or to make them feel dumb? Jay is really great at making me see when I argue to be right. If I'm trying to help him with something, I often take the duh tone, like put it together this way, duh. <laughs> we were grilling the other night and our grill is, well, meh, so food kind of sticks to it. So I googled how to grill successfully and I found that you have to make sure to coat the food with olive oil. So he was going to grill some brats and sausages and I kept telling him over and over again to use the oil because I was right. I mean, I had researched, I spent all this time, like I knew what I was talking about, but I couldn't just say it once. I had to say it over and over again because I was right and he obviously like didn't know what to do. So I stopped focusing on him as my partner in that moment because I wanted him to acknowledge that I was right about the grill. <laughs> my mission very quickly went from wanting to help him to wanting to be right. He heard me about the olive oil and he did it too. He didn't do it exactly the way I did it, no, but he did it. And as his partner, I need to give him the space to do things his way and to figure out the answers he is seeking. My love for him is more important to me than being right. Not only that, but he always points out to me that I'm trying to make him feel dumb in the way that I get him to see that I am right. I learned to argue to the death, so to speak, growing up. I learned to argue and manipulate situations in order to get my way. So I can get really self-righteous when it comes to something teeny like olive oil on some brats, like do it my way or you're an idiot. I learned that growing up and that is, uh, and that is conditional love. Do it my way or you are wrong because I am right is a dangerous mentality in a relationship. An open dialogue, a willingness to agree to disagree, a vulnerable and calm interaction, and a letting go of the need to be right in pursuit of unconditional love in your relationship has to come before your need to be right. Take a minute to think of a time when you argued to be right. Reflect on how you took your love away from the person you are in relationship with simply to prove a point or to be right. What will change next time? What solutions can you choose to find? Now I want to talk about the power of choice. 
When I tell clients that they should consider not arguing to be right, it's often like a lot of other things, right? Easier said than done, Rose. <laughs> Oftentimes we engage in impulsive behavior. Think about how you react to something that happens. Let's say your boyfriend disagrees with something you have done. In a BPD brain, what typically happens is impulsive reaction to the situation. Something in our environment happens to upset us and we jump right to reaction. Neurotypical brains often have an ability to create a space between the thing that happens in the environment and the response that is given. Because people with BPD haven't yet practiced how to recognize this space and how to make a choice when there, we tend to react impulsively and ignore the space entirely. So in the previous example of the boyfriend disagreeing with something you have done, in the BPD mind, there will typically be a reaction. Maybe you feel attacked and start attacking back or trying to prove what you did was good or trying to be right or change his mind in some way and then turns into some big over-the-top fight. Imagine if you were to pause deliberately before responding, not reacting to his disappointment. You could choose to hear his point of view then. You could choose to stop seeing his advice as an attack and to open your mind to a new perspective. You can choose to forgive him if he is attacking you. You can choose anything you want, essentially, because choice offers us freedom. Think of your brain as separated into three parts, just for a moment. There's your emotion mind, your logical or rational mind, and the wise mind. So this is actually pulled from DBT. The goal for us in recovery is to step out of our emotional minds and into our wise minds by inserting facts and logics into that emotional mind to create a wise mind. Wise mind is a good place to be because it means that you are taking into account logic and emotion when making wise and sensible choices and not leaving one or the other out. Oftentimes it's difficult for people with BPD to leave the emotion mind because, well, it feels good to be there, honestly. I know this isn't something that people talk about a lot because it's kind of odd, but being in that deep, intense emotion feels good. It's chaotic, but we like it because it somehow gives us an illusory sense of control and it is comfortable, not because it feels good, but because it is so familiar. This has been our whole life, so when we get revved up in our emotion mind and we get into an argument with someone, it's often difficult not to continue on just to be right because of this tendency to stay only in our feelings. We react rather than respond, and we stay in that emotional mindset. We even ramp up and become more and more dysregulated because of sort of, it's like sort of an addiction to the feeling of intensity that the mood offers. It's a dysfunctional pattern of behavior and it doesn't help your recovery, honestly. Also, it's pretty dang exhausting to go through all that emotion, let's be real. So before you can stop feeding that emotional intensity, that addiction, and practice unconditional love, you may wanna try and create the space or pause between something that happens in the environment and your reaction so that you can choose to respond and to avoid the old pattern of behavior or being overly emotional and getting dysregulated. What I do is make sure that I don't say the first thing that comes to my head when someone says or does something that makes me feel some type of way. <laughs> I will actually pause. Maybe I'll look down or take a deep breath, but I start to think of the best plan. Sometimes I will have to say, excuse me and go to the bathroom if I can't figure it out right away because it's kind of odd to stand there in like a really, really long pause. It can also be attention seeking, so watch out for that. The pause should only be a few seconds. But in that time, I pause to think of solutions and a good way to respond to avoid a big blowout argument or to avoid making anyone around me feel bad about themselves or our relationship. It was so difficult at first. I kept intending to respond, but still reacting. And then when I mastered responding, I eventually reacted. The more I kept at it though, the better I got at it, and I stopped having huge blowout arguments that revolved around my own selfish need to be right. I became a better mother and a better partner, a better version of myself. 
So this week, I want you to practice unconditional love by creating a space or a pause before you react so that you can choose communication over arguing to be right and love over intense emotion. Remember that like a child learning something new, you will be really bad at it at first and it will seem impossible. Don't get caught up in the steps. Of course you will be bad at something you never did before. This makes sense. Try it. Practice it. Commit to it. If you have a logical loved one in your life, seek them out for guidance or get some help from a qualified, experienced coach or therapist. All right, time for some Q&A. This week's Q&A is going to focus on a question that I receive daily. So the question is, generally speaking, how do I come up with what morals and values I want on my moral compass and where do I start with my moral compass work? Another one, big one, is are the morals and values that I chose the right ones? Okay, so what I have found in my time doing this work is that the morals that should be on your moral compass are the ones that I sort of list, listed out for you. Ones like forgiveness, love, integrity, honesty, loyalty, bravery, courage. A lot of people have been adding different little things to their moral compass, which is great. You can add things like creativity, um, or you can add things like self-care. Those are awesome things too. But when you're looking at your moral compass, you want morals to be on it. Being creative is something that most of us with BPD naturally are. So of course we want to be more creative. It's much easier to be creative than it is to be courageous or brave. Being courageous or brave means having fear about doing something, but doing it anyway, doing something hard in the face of fear. Being creative means, well, I'm going to minimize it a little bit, but it's not as hard as being courageous and brave, right? I can go to Hobby Lobby, buy a bunch of stuff up or Michaels or whatever, come home, use my cricket and have some really creative stuff happening. Or if you're a guy, maybe you're designing or building something. Creativity is an awesome skill to have and something that can be part of who you are, of your identity development. But when you're putting things on your moral compass, make sure that there are actual morals, there are things that are difficult to do. If it's on your moral compass and it's easy, we can probably throw it out the window. <laughs> um, Another thing that I will say to people out there doing the moral compass work is to make sure before you do anything that you figure out what you want for your life so that you can make sure that your choices within your moral compass work align with your mission. Another thing I will say, and this is the last thing, is that if you're having a really hard time with this and you don't know where to go or start, start with being loyal to your word. So say what you mean and mean what you say. If you're not loyal to your word, then nothing you say would matter. And then it wouldn't matter whether or not you were brave or courageous or any of those other things. So if you can't trust your word and yourself and the people around you can't trust you, then not many other things matter. So start by being loyal to your word. And if you're out there working on your moral compass work, just know that that's something that's really brave. So you're probably already being way braver than you anticipate or expect. Now, I know it's pretty harsh to say to take off creativity and some of the other things you have on your moral compass that are more like traits or characteristics or hobbies. But I don't want you to throw them away entirely or make yourself feel bad because you didn't do the assignment quote unquote right. It's difficult for me to convey everything all in one podcast episode. So like always, if you need support or some coaching, check out our website at thriveonlinecounseling.com and go ahead and schedule. You can even schedule with Jay if you want a partner or if you're a man and you need a man's perspective. All right, everybody. I hope you all have a great week and keep sending your questions. We'll see you next week. Okay, thanks for listening. That was from Borderline and Beautiful, a production of Thrive Mind Body LLC, online coaching that helps frustrated individuals, resentful couples, and disconnected families navigate through tough times. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. 
If you like this show, remember, you can hear it on Anchor or Apple Podcasts or Pocket Casts or any app that you use to listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get a new episode every Monday. If you want to get in touch, you can leave me a voice message. Some of you had some comments and questions from the last episodes, and I'd love to hear whatever questions you have too. Just download the Anchor mobile app, search for From Borderline to Beautiful, and tap the message button to send me a voice message. We'll have all those links in the show description. Okay, we made it. Thanks again for listening. I'm Rose Skeeters, and I'll be back next week with another episode of From Borderline to Beautiful. Talk to you then.